knowing what you're dealing with, picking what you have to work with, and then understanding that it takes time and that mm -hmm. decade, problems that took decades to, to create are not going to be healed in like one round. It might take you several years, if not longer, depending on mm -hmm. what the contamination is and where it is and how many different types of contamination are present. certain things like for example if you're trying to grow a food garden and there is contamination in your soil um, if you can really build up the microbial health of your soil like lots of microbes lots of compost things like that it actually in some cases with some metals it'll decrease their availability mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. and it'll also make it harder for the plants to pull them up uh -huh. right okay. so it's also interesting if you're trying to pull something up but you're also adding lots of compost it's like the microbes are like fighting to bind it and hold it down and the plants can't necessarily pull up what they want to pull yeah, up. Yeah, so yeah, that's actually yeah. good if you want to eat that plant in right, some ways. It's right. not 100% and it really depends on the different heavy metal you're working yeah. with. But things like that, like putting in a lot of um, microbes in there, mycorrhizal fungi. There's different types of mushrooms. Mycorrhizal fungi is the type of fungi that is kind of uh, has mutualistic relationships with plants. It lives on the root hairs or within mm -hmm. the roots of plants, and it helps plants get nutrients and more water and protect it against disease. And these things, they basically will hold on in some ways to heavy metals. Like it'll keep mm -hmm. the heavy metal from moving up into mm -hmm. the plant. It'll mm -hmm. just kind of like lock it at the roots. Okay. So that's something. So some people might find ways to inoculate their plants with mycorrhizal fungi. You can buy that at a nursery and like dip your plants in it, or you can actually find ways to bring mycorrhizal fungi back into your environment. Um, so that's something that people can kind of do in those situations. But... Those are some of the immobilization things. And then there's also things like adding phosphorus to your soil with some heavy metals can actually immobilize mm -hmm. that heavy metal because mm -hmm. what it does is it reacts with the heavy metal mm -hmm. and it creates a different compound. Mm -hmm. It hasn't broken it down, but it's created a more inert version yes, of that yes, metal. Yes, yes. So phosphorus, for example, with lead, if you add phosphorus to lead, it creates something called lead pyromorphite. And it's way harder to pull that up and it's fairly inert. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And again, it's not as simple as it sounds like you have to have things in the right state. You have to have the right kind of phosphorus. If you have any arsenic in your soil, it actually makes the arsenic kind of more mobile. Mm -hmm. So it can be kind of complicated. Mm -hmm. But in certain situations, that might be what you go for. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and a good source of phosphorus is ground up fish bones. Yeah. Right. Okay. So anyway, just not to get complicated, but heavy metals, if you're trying to mobilize them or you're trying to pull them up. If you're trying to pull them up figuring out what you're going to do with them. And then chemicals are different in the sense that you can actually break them down. Mm -hmm. So oftentimes we're dealing with mushrooms, like breaking down things like hydrocarbons and pesticides, right? Um, or we're dealing with plants that pull them up and kind of like evaporate, um, break them down within the plant body. There's also a lot of things that happen with microbes breaking down. Like people use bacteria to break down hydrocarbons in oil spills all the time. Sure. Um, or even certain plants and grasses have really great relationships with bacteria. Like mulberry trees have really neat relationships with bacteria, mm -hmm. or a lot of the different things like clover um, and, and vetches and things like that, they will create perfect habitats for a certain type of bacteria that is really good at breaking down that pesticide or that hydrocarbon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so just kind of knowing that, knowing what you're dealing with, picking what you have to work with, and then understanding that it takes time and that mm -hmm. decade, problems that took decades to, to create are not going to be healed in like one round. It might take you several years, if not longer, depending on mm -hmm. what the contamination is and where it is and how many different types of contamination are present. Sounds like it's a to mouthful. Me. Well, <laughs> I'm sorry. It no, no, no yeah. apologies. Because for many of us, if we realize that if we have a condition in our body mm -hmm. that's been building for many, many years quietly and we aren't aware of it, healing that, I'm thinking of a chronic disease, healing that is going to take time yeah. because you're un unlayering, you know, the problem. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I hear that too. So the call is to both, that I, that I imagine for people is, is, to, is that that patience comes with a kind of dedication to being what a real true healer is going to be, yeah. is, is, is both observant and caring and Persistent. Yeah, you know, persistent. To, 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 yeah. to meet the needs. And this isn't glamorous work, because mm -hmm. I think sometimes people, you know, it's sexy and it sells. Oh, you're selling your savior. Right. Yes. So, so if, if you say to someone, like, you know, this is going to heal the world, and it's like, it's going to take a lot of time and a lot of mm -hmm. effort and a lot of us, the path is still, we have a lot of exploration to do yeah. and a lot of experimentation yeah. to do. And a lot of, I don't know, my drive for writing this book is that 
that needs to come also from the grassroots because there's experimentation happening. Um, it's happening in corporations, it's happening in, in academia, in governments, and in, in you know universities, and it's not making its way mm -hmm. down to the ground, and it's not mm -hmm. always happening in a way that's really integrative or like you know actually reflective of the field. Yes, you yes, know, like yes. you can do something in a lab, but it's going to be very different when right. you're outside. Right. And so, if you look at something like, for example. Um, the radical mycology movement. And this is like all the folks who are trying to figure out like, how do I cultivate mush mushrooms in my backyard? How do I use mushrooms to heal the following contaminants? And it's as grassroots as it can get. And you have all these different folks figuring it out, coming together at different gatherings. There's mm. something called the radical mycology convergence that's happened for the last couple of years. And people come together and teach each other for several days, all these different skills around growing mushrooms, around using mushrooms as medicine, using mushrooms to like heal the land. Um, and it's really, really cheap, if not free, you know? And it's really neat because you look at that and a lot of my friends who are doing that work will say how a lot of the kind of, um, I'm losing my brain here right now, a lot of the advances is happening because of grassroots mycologists. Yes. Yes. It's folks coming together and experimenting and being like, I just figured out how to do this really amazing way to grow mushrooms in my backyard. Now I'm going to share it with all of you guys. I'm going to share both my successes and I'm also going to share my failures so that you don't have to make the same mistake I did. And so that's really important in this work and, and just people learning how to, better do it because we have to because we have a very degraded contaminated environment those problems aren't going away mm -hmm. we have to find a way to make it better and we have to find a way to you know figure out that path it strikes me that that the kind of regenerative work that you're doing yeah. is is that it could be the umbrella for what's needed in many parts of our culture and that it comes from the grassroots is probably the most sane because it's not about the money of it, it's not about the power yeah, of it, yeah. and it's the healing for ourselves and the and life on the planet. Yeah, coming coming where it probably always has best, you know, evolution yeah. coming from from the ground up, the grassroots up. Yeah, and very specific solutions for very specific places. And also, I want to make sure this is really clear. It's like local. It's like when you think about grassroots, it's on any certain site you want to work with the plants and the microbes and the mushrooms that are indigenous yes, to that yes, site first, yes. if you can, right? Sometimes you might have to bring in a more kind of cultivated variety, but by and large, you want to work with what's on mm -hmm. that site because those are going to be the most resilient and, and sure. the best healers, and it's less likely you're going to throw things out of whack, sure. right? And so you just think of, I know, I look through plant lists, and I have a list in this book which is saying, these are the following plants that are good for the following heavy metals and the following this, and there's a lot of plants on that list. Um, but there's also a lot of plants that are in our local environment that have never been tested ah. because the same plants keep getting tested. We know what ah. mustard can do. We know okay. what sunflowers can do. We know what maybe something like alpine pennycress. Those are the ones you always hear mm -hmm. about. But you don't necessarily know about what, I don't know, there might be a local plant that's doing incredible work. And if you go to certain contaminated sites in your area and you keep seeing the same thing mm -hmm. that's growing there, it might mean that it's just adapted to that and it's right. tolerant. It might not right. be pulling anything up or it might be something that we've never studied that has incredible potential an and it's healing the land, right? I mean, what I mean, what I feel, the excitement of, this is a big edge to explore. Yeah. You know, unknown, an unknown, unknown territory that I hope a lot of people will do. Yeah. Okay. You know, I mean, there's, we could go on We can on, go on. But is there anything really critical that we haven't covered? Two things. Okay. Okay, one, just on what you just said. So, there's this huge drive to experiment, um, and I hope people get excited and they want to. But with that comes the need to be safe and the need to be careful. So my dad was a doctor, my mom's a nurse, and it's really important for me that people don't get sick from doing the work. Mm. And if you go into certain settings, like I remember when I first started looking into this, my drive was oil spills. I was like, I want to know how people can respond to oil spills because the industry does a really bad job of doing that. And you look at any spill that's happened in the States and Canada in the last little while, it doesn't go well, right? And local people are really impacted in a lot of ways. And so I was looking into that, and my idea was to get people just going out and doing that kind of work. And then I started doing the research, and a lot of people who go out into really contaminated environments and respond get really sick, right? Especially if they're not wearing the proper gear. And so I want to say, if you are, if you're working in like a, you know, low contaminated, you know, there's a little bit of contamination in there, but it's not the biggest deal, you know, that's not necessarily what I'm talking about here. But if you're responding to a spill, if you're working on a site that actually does have really high heavy mm -hmm. metal levels um, or chemical levels, you do need to take precautions. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, so gloves, skin, yeah. breathing it and yep. so on. So wearing gloves, uh -huh. wearing potentially like a respirator, mm -hmm. knowing mm -hmm. how to actually use that respirator, mm -hmm. right? Like these are important mm -hmm. things. So I just want to say that 
you don't want, and, and one of the things that government gets kind of worked up about when people start doing this work is that people are going to make themselves sick, yeah, yeah. or they're going to start, you know, moving around contamination and actually exposing other people to it. Yes. So it's really important. Those are valid concerns. You do it Absolutely. well. Don't be reckless. Take care of your health because you can't do earth healing work if you aren't that's, well. That's true. Really important. And so in the book, I talk about different um, kind of protective gear you mm -hmm. want to wear, mm -hmm. um, and you want to encourage your friends to wear it too. So even something as simple as when you're doing like kind of working with lead soil, the clothes that you're wearing. You know, don't use that for other things. Don't use the shoes uh -huh. that you're doing that work in and walk everywhere with it. Don't let your kid you hug you. Yes, yeah, after yes, you've been like covered yes. in lead dust, right? Yes. If you're washing your hands or like taking a shower, don't use hot water because it opens your pores. And brings it in. Yeah. yeah. So just things yeah. like that. Uh -huh. It's like, you know, Helpful. just Good. get those things Good. down if you're going to do this work. And then the other thing is that the neat thing is plants and mushrooms are not only healing the land in their own ways, on their own time frame, right? So we got to be patient and figure out how to do that work in a good way. But they also are healers of people. And so there's a whole chapter in the book where I talk to different herbalists and ask them, you know, if you're someone who's living in a contaminated environment, oh. and, and I would argue a lot of us are living in that, but mm. there are some places that are way worse than others where people are getting huge amounts of cancer and, and resp respiratory illness mm -hmm. and things like that because of the toxic legacy that they're living with, if you're in an environment like that, or if you're a first responder, having to respond to things like oil spills or respond to any kind of toxic incident, what are the things you can do to protect yourself? Mm -hmm. And if you're a grassroots buyer mediator and you decide that I'm gonna go start working in my community and cleaning up all these contaminated areas, over time, you're exposing yourself to a lot of things yes. that are going to break your body down, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. there's a whole chapter in there that talks about different um, plant allies, different herbs, different healing foods, different mushrooms to work with, right? To keep yourself stronger in yeah. a sense to, to fight off whatever yeah. exposure that help you're going to get. Help detox or help mm -hmm. give you preventive. So like the mushrooms, mm -hmm. for example, like reishi, shiitake, turkey tail, lion's mane, incredible when it comes to preventing cancer. Um, and helping people with their liver and, and autoimmune and mm -hmm. inflammation and all those things also are produced by toxins. Like if we wow. have a huge toxic exposure, things like cancer are a problem. Yes, yeah. People get autoimmune disorder. It's like these things are all your liver gets blown out. So a lot of the medicinal mushrooms are really important and having like a, a regime of that is really important. And then things like milk thistle, which is a weed. Milk Amazing. Thistle. Yeah. Milk thistle. Yes. Milk thistle. Yeah. Incredible for your liver. Or cilantro, really good for helping people, mm -hmm. you know, get rid of heavy metals. And, and again, if anyone's going to do any kind of detox work, making sure they're drinking enough water, that they're, you know, making sure things are coming out of their body instead of just swimming around. Right, right, right. Yeah, so right. there's a whole kind of piece on that. But I, again, you can't do this work if you're not well. And if you want to support other people in communities where, you know, health is an issue because of the toxic mm -hmm. legacy that's left there or that people are currently living with, you know, trying to make sure that they have some of those things in their so that they can get better. Yeah. It's just, that's part of the healing work. Yeah. Right. And all those medicines, the funny thing is, is all those medicines also need a healthy environment. Mm -hmm. Right? So we also can't mm -hmm. be well if the land mm -hmm. isn't well, mm -hmm. and the land can't be well if we're not well. And so it's like, we got a lot of work to do. and It's all, it's all, in, it's all, all in. meshed together. Yeah. Right. So I would just really encourage people to like, start learning. Pick something they're really passionate about when it comes to doing healing work with the land. And I prefer saying earth healing versus earth repair. Mm. Earth repair just was, I guess, a more sexy title. Mm -hmm. But like, if you're going to do healing work with the land, start reading up and try to figure out, you know, take that role as a healer and, and, and try to figure out, you know, what you're called to in that mm -hmm. and, and start experimenting in a safe way with others around you. Right? And, and find your allies, both mm -hmm. in the human world and in the more than human world. Yeah, and there are, and again, grassroots is important people doing this work in a local mm -hmm. way for the lands that they love. Um, and I'd also say that anybody can be grassroots. Like, there are people in academia, there are people in government who want to take their skills and who want to take um, mm -hmm. what they do and apply it to this and make it easier for this work to happen. Yes, There's yeah. a lot of academic people who want to like have their research support this work. And it's just about making the connections so that we're all doing work in service of you know, the land and, and community. So Thank you for your service in bringing all of this together yes. including I think it's especially rich all the you know the, the inclusiveness that I feel that you're concerned for all the parts all the players um, mm -hmm. and, and and your help to, to boost that kind of symbiosis yeah yeah in a way. and this book couldn't happen I want to be really clear like I did a lot of research and I I learned a lot by talking to the people who are in the field mm -hmm. doing the work. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of people who are out there doing the work and they share their knowledge with me and that's what's in the book. Okay. And there's people who also wrote for the book. And so I want to give props to all the, the micro remediators and the, the phyto people and, you know, like all the people who are like loving the land and doing that work and getting all up in the information. Oh, beautiful. So. beautiful. It's like you may be the funnel through which this all came, got organized together, but it's representative of yeah. a multitude. And there's people who aren't in this book. Like there's like so many 
there's so much work that's happening and I'm learning about different things every day. Right. So I think that's the neat thing. And so it's like for whatever's not in here, there's like a few stories of like things people have tried and things people are doing. And then there's more things that are happening on the ground. You, you know? could be learning all your life. Yeah, you Thank could you. be. Yeah. And you would still not have enough. <laughs> so, you know. Enjoy yeah. the adventure. I mean, you have to jo enjoy the journey because, yeah. It's, yeah, it's going to be just continuing to unfold. Yeah. If you, if you like hard work and you like learning, you're good. And you like the and, and you like working with these kinds of beings, I think. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Thank you for this. Thank you. And and may you know may it blossom. I may be this right with a lot of healing because people are inspired and, and have tools to work with now. That, yeah. That empowers them. All about it. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I'm with Lila Darwich, who is an earth healer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One day I'll, I'll be Help, able to call myself that. Helping with pride. people to become that. Becoming yeah. That. Yeah, learning, learning about it. Bioremediation. I'm Janaea Donaldson. This is Peak Moment. Join us next time.